Good morning. I'm talking this morning with John Fallon from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. I'm Gary Schoenwolf from the University of Utah. And John and I are attending the 7th Avian Sciences meeting in Nagoya, Japan. What we also call the Chick Meeting, since the meeting is focused on chick embryology, evolution, and avian genomics. Good morning, John. Good morning, Gary. How are you? I'm just fine. Are you enjoying your time in Nagoya? I really love Japan and I'm enjoying my time here and we have good tea and fantastic noodles and terrific science. Oh, wonderful. Glad you're having a good time. I'm having a great time as well. Wonderful. <laughs> John, I'd like to talk with you today about your very successful career as a developmental biologist and anatomist. Can we begin by having you summarize your training and academic positions? Sure. Um, I went to Marquette University, and uh, initially I wanted to become a professional philosopher, so I majored in philosophy, and I enjoyed zoology, so I took courses in zoology. I found them not very interesting because they were highly repetitive and not very creative to my mind. Uh, then I took a course from John Saunders, and it was called cell physiology, I think. And uh, Saunders had a way of synthesizing things and challenging the students that I thought was really terrific. Mm. And I believed if that's what zoology was, maybe I would uh, try to get a major in that instead of just taking courses for fun. So I went to see John Saunders and told him that I was a philosophy major. I was accepted to graduate school in philosophy, but I would like to work with him and change my major, my uh, graduate training to zoology. He said, well, first of all, are you going to work your ass off? <laughs> and then he said, well, we'll give it a try. So he, I said yes, and he said, give it a try. So um, I started to wash glassware, that was my initiation, but Mary Gasling was in the lab, it was a small lab, and uh, pretty soon I started to ask Mary if I could do things, and I began to open eggs and began to get interested, and so one thing led to another, and five years later I was graduating uh, from uh, Marquette with a PhD degree, and I practically immediately went on active duty for two years in 1967, uh, 8, and 8. Uh, so I had two years of active duty. I was in the Medical Service Corps and my specialty was uh, certain kinds of diagnostic techniques that uh, were crucial for the success of various missions. Were you I stationed never, in the U.S.? I was stationed in, at Natick Laboratories in uh, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. Uh, I never left the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got out in 1968, and at the end of 1968, I started to interview at various places. And, of course, Wisconsin attracted me, and it turned out that they were recruiting someone who could teach embryology, histology, development, and I interviewed and came out on top, and we moved there January 1st. So I didn't really, I never had a postdoc. All I did was go from uh, PhD to active duty and then on to uh, mm -hmm. a job. I had three chil two children and one on the way. So you were already married at that point uh, to Elaine. Yes. So where did you guys meet? We met at Marquette University. Uh, I thought if I was going to be a professional philosopher, I might want to know something about education, so I call it, took an educational psychology co course, which was terrible, but I met her, and uh, then we uh, eventually uh, fell in love and uh, got married. Mm -hmm. And you told me earlier, <coughs> I think yesterday, that you're going to be married 50 years. We are married 50 years, and about yes. about to leave on a cruise yes. to celebrate that. Absolutely. That's wonderful. It is. So you started out um, working in John Saunders' lab, and yes. you said it was a small lab. Uh, John Saunders, of course, is very well known in the field. Yes. Uh, probably the most famous developmental biologist of the 20th century. I think he's uh, right up there. He's certainly yeah. up there. Um, what was he like to work with? Well, he... 
allowed you to find your own way. And he was very critical of data analysis and pacing of the research, being sure that you kept going. And writing for him was very difficult because you would go through many, many, many drafts. <laughs> Uh, Pre-word processing, too. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I, I did this for my PhD thesis, and I think we had 30 copies. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so uh, that had an effect on me, and I've never done that to any of my students. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, I, I, you ended up writing like John Saunders, which wasn't a bad thing, but it was like not, wearing not somebody you. else's clothes. Right. <laughs> they didn't necessarily fit. So it, it, it did affect me. I thought that he, he was um, superb in experimental design controls, insisting on that. He was excellent at presentations as, uh, well, you and I are cousins, so right. you know that the uh, Willier family was uh, very good at communicating the science. Yes. Fantastic opportunity to yes, work with John. It was. Yeah. And John is how old now? I think he's 92. 92. Right, right there, yeah. And he lives in what's he, he lives in Falmouth. Falmouth, I yeah. close to what's mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Very good. Uh, so you had, you started out with a, a primary love in philosophy. Yes. How do you think that impacted how you do your science, uh, how you do your teaching, basically how you pursued what you do. Right. Philosophy uh, has a, a, a demand for rigor, and I think that that is part of the way I do my science. I uh, and I, I'm also trained was trained in, in logic, and so my abilities to form arguments and so forth uh, were honed. Sure. Um, by the Jesuits, who, who are gone now essentially, but uh, were tremendous task massacres at how you think and uh, how you do. Yeah. <clears throat> so I know uh, you've been a scientist most of your life, but I know yes. you did a few other things. Yes. Uh, so what other kinds of things did you do? Well, the main thing, occupation I had was I worked my way through college mm -hmm. selling awnings and windows. <laughs> and so some can weeks... Get, can you give me a good deal? Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, um, I, I worked on the phone and on the street. And on the phone, my name was Don Kent. Don Kent? Yes. So, uh, Why Superman's brother. <laughs> Clark's brother. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so um, I, I did that many times, 30 hours a week. Wow. So um, that, that's why I ended up with a commission, because I did ROTC, and they paid my rent. And uh, I, to pay back, I would have done whatever mm -hmm. was necessary to pay back. Sure. Um, it, and it helped me a lot. So the, my, that was my major other occupation was sales. But what I'm doing now is sales. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. How I am able to present things, uh, it, it ends up that the, between the philosophy, John Saunders training, and sales, uh, I had a, a good package. Mm -hmm. Were you very good at sales? I was. You sold a lot of awnings? Uh, yeah, I did. I sold a lot of awnings but they, because they fired you. If you didn't. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's nothing, um, no sentimentality. Mm -hmm. You're gone. <laughs> Producer, you're gone. Right. I worked for Sounds four familiar, years. actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not so different than yeah. life today. Uh, so, John, you work in the vertebrate limb field is known as as you know, by virtually everyone in the field of developmental biology. You're clearly a leader in the field. Field. Uh, what do you feel are the most important discoveries that you've made to the field? I think that showing that Sonic Hedgehog was necessary for limb development but not sufficient uh, in a variety of ways, and that if you removed Sonic Hedgehog, 
and glee, then you got all three levels of the limb to form, mm -hmm. which is a little bit uh, paradoxical considering the hypotheses in the field. And there were serendipitous uh, things that we uh, published, like the hen's teeth, and that has triggered a, a lot of talk and mm -hmm. um, people have done things because we published that paper. Sure. Uh, another is that we a foray into um, evolution and we started to ask questions about whether genes and evolution would help us to understand certain problems, like whether the digits in the wing are 2, 3, 4, or 1, 2, 3, and we published a paper saying they were 1, 2, 3 because of anterior gene expression that was there and uh, accompanied digit 1 formation. And How does that play into our understanding of evolution? The limited I think numbers? that uh, well, we also published a paper that said uh, birds are dinosaurs, <laughs> and that that I think was uh, an important. It, we stirred the pot just at the right moment, yes. and everybody was ready to launch into that. Mm -hmm. So, it was, and th those side things were huge fun. Sure. So I think you're still having fun with that because you've uh, been interviewed. And yes. uh, on television. Yes. Did you enjoy that experience? I did. I mm -hmm. did. Um, I invited Matt Harris, who was doing a postdoc in Germany, back in Tübingen. Uh, I, I invited him back so that he would take part in the filming. Mm -hmm. And um, there, I had never been filmed before. And now you have groupies, I imagine. Right. Oh, trailing absolutely. you everywhere. I, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, and the and the the guy was just terrific uh, in interviewing. He he there was a cameraman and then the director and the director would talk you through this and then he 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 would ask a question and he when they uh, released it it was somebody else that asked the question but he would ask the question and then he would go around the camera and go like this <laughs> to to. I don't know if that was visible on the camera. But. <laughs> to bring out a smile. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, and, the, and it's a very intense couple of days, and they just take over the lab. It was. It oh, was, you spent a couple of days? I yeah, it was, it was terrific. And we went uh, and sh we talked about uh, feathers developing from scales, and Matt had done that. So they wanted to see the silky bird. Mm -hmm. So we went down to the... Uh, poultry and uh, the flocks of birds there were there and the flocks know me because I feed them lettuce and uh, so I, I walked into the the pen and I got, I got a bird and I gave it to Matt and then we went to a second pen to get the normal bird and I stepped in and they were all very calm and then the a uh, cameraman who was 6'4", had a big camera, uh, decided to come into the pen. And the chicken said, oh no, this isn't right, and they were flying all over, and one of them ran out into the hallway. And I had my booties on and my lab coat, and I'm chasing after the, the escaped chicken, and the director says, to, uh, they're running beside me, the director says to the cameraman, are you getting this? <laughs> so, of course, when they showed it, my grandchildren were all waiting for the outtakes, um, which never, never came. came. <laughs> uh, but it was enjoyable, and everybody in the lab had fun, and everybody was in, the scene, in a scene, mm -hmm. uh, whether just doing something or... Uh, yeah. It was very cool. <laughs> Sounds like it was a great deal of fun. It was, it was. <laughs> and I also get... Uh, email, they replay it, and I get emails saying, have you ever seen a bird like this? And, and they had photoshopped mammalian teeth into the chicken with <laughs> a big smile. And, and, and you can just tell when sure. I stopped responding. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> so in addition to your work on limb development, uh, I know you've done some work, early work actually, on fertilization. Yes, I worked with C.R. Austin, mm -hmm. and Austin was a Cambridge uh, professor, Darwin professor at uh, Cambridge. He came to Woods Hole, and I was in the 
fertilization and gamete physiology training program, and we could pick any of a number of people. Uh, many of them uh, were, were very, very active and famous. Katsuma Dan was one of them, who's oh, yes. uh, a Japanese uh, cell and developmental biologist who, who was just wonderful. And I was rubbing shoulders with all these people, but I was attracted to, to Austin, and uh, he had a different style from uh, Saunders. It was more relaxed, just as rigorous, but more hands-on, over your shoulder, how's it going, uh, all the time. And so I decided to repeat experiments uh, done by Frank Lilly, Frank R. Oh, Lilly, yes. on fertilization in Nereus limbata. And I was able to, uh, at the electron microscope level, uh, look at the same things that Frank Lilly looked at. And there were various controversies in the field as to what was going on during egg activation. And uh, so we ended up with uh, getting a, a paper out of that. It was my first published paper. Lily, of course, he used the light microscope. Yes, he used the light microscope. Not and the, they had these the beautiful electron. drawings yeah. right. that I had. Uh -huh. sure. And um, so it, and it, well, they were very accurate when you looked at the increased uh, magnification and resolution of yes. the electron microscope. So um, we got a paper submitted to the Journal of Experimental Zoology and it came back and there were 100 comments on the paper. And so I, I said to... Not all good, I'm assuming. <laughs> no, I said to Austin, whose na name was Bunny, he, he was called Bunny. Bunny? Um, How did he get that I, I don't name? know. <laughs> Bunny. <laughs> Bunny Austin. Everybody called him Bunny. Um, and so he said, no, no, we'll, we'll just go through this together. So we went through each comment. And he said, well, you can make a change here, we'll make a change here, we'll make a change here. Here, we'd, we can do this, we'll do that. And then um, he said, and, and these ones that are left behind, uh, maybe 12 or 15, he said, we'll just say we're taking author's prerogative. I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> down the tubes. But that's not right. And he ended the uh, letter by saying, uh, the reviewer's comments have significantly improved the manuscript. We hope you will agree, and it now may be sent to press, which it was. <laughs> That's wonderful. So you were working, I was working with a pro. You were working who was, with a pro Who wanted sure. me by his side every step of the way. Yes. And I learned huge amount. Mm -hmm. and, and that's so different from John Saunders, who would be taking you through. And, and you learn things, of course. But I, uh, I, I ended up with different uh, styled document when I did it with Bunny Austin versus when I did it with Saunders. And I hope that my students would all say it was closer to Bunny Austin's approach. Wow. Yeah. There's a uh, meeting that occurs, I believe, generally every two years, sometimes every four years, sometimes every year, uh, the Lim meeting. Yes. Uh, you were actively involved in starting that meeting. Um, I was active uh, in, in the meeting um, sort of after the third or fourth one. Oh, you weren't at the beginning, okay. Uh, not at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was in Colorado, and the next one I think was in Glasgow. And the Europeans did that, and, and I forget exactly the sequence. But then uh, the Germans were supposed to do it, and the, the German economy was bad, and things uh, just faltered. And so I polled the community, got uh, um, Bob Kelly and Paul Gotink, Arnie Kaplan, and we put together, Jeff McCabe also, we put together a, a grant proposal, mm -hmm. and um, I sort of was the, the organizer. So after, I think, a four-year, four or five-year hiatus, and people had forgot about it, thought, forgotten about it, essentially, uh, we brought it back, and that so was the Asilomar conference. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, and uh, that was dedicated to John Saunders. Mm -hmm. And uh, since he was retired at that time, it gave his uh, presence in the community a boost, and it was very good for him. Right. He also published that as a series of volumes. Yes. The, we did two of them in a row. Um, I think uh, the, the, at the University of Connecticut, and then the hiatus, and then uh, the Asilomar. And they're they are published proceedings that uh, nearly everyone, and it was a huge number, of two volumes, mm -hmm. uh, everyone submitted four or five page papers. You couldn't get anybody to do that now. No, it would uh, be difficult. Right. And I would collect them and edit them, and then I flew to uh, Wiley Liss and uh, delivered them to the, the, the press. This is very cool. Now you'd do it all electronically, okay. wouldn't you? Just hit the button. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> And so now the meeting has been going since we reinstituted it. Yeah, I don't remember the, what the last one was numbered as, do you? No, I don't remember either. But it's probably yeah. approaching 10 or so, no? Yeah. Do you remember what that is, Taka? What number? Okay. <laughs> Our uh, cameraman today is uh, Taka Suzuki. I should have introduced him. You can't see him right now because he's behind the camera. Uh, but Taka is a former postdoc with John Fallon. And we were teasing earlier, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask John with talk in the room is, who is your best student? Right. <laughs> Just to see what the response would be. <laughs> talk I wanted to ask that question. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so John, uh, you've obviously been an incredibly active researcher in the field, but it's, that's not all you've done. <laughs> you've done many other things. You've been an active teacher of students at all levels. Yes. I think you taught medical histology yes. for a number of years. Uh, you've been involved with undergraduate students yes. in the honors biology. Yes. And uh, of course postdocs um, and graduate student yes. training of various kinds. Uh, what, what, how do you view the role of teaching in your own personal career development? And what is your teaching philosophy? That's an interesting question. Uh, teach, I view teaching as half of what I do, whether it's at the lab bench or in the classroom or going out and giving seminars or taking part in courses in other people's institutions. I think that, that being in a university like the University of Wisconsin is, a, is just a tremendous opportunity because there's a, a, an openness on the campus and it uh, means that there are many training programs that go across the campus. Many courses are taught by faculty from numerous departments might come in and teach so that the students are getting uh, a diversity of styles and they're learning information uh, from people who are superbly expert in, in the area that they're being taught. So the, and the, for teaching medical students, I thought that it was an important thing for them to be able to visualize the structures so that once I, uh, I was the course director and I, I had a rose and I was introducing the course and I said, now um, this is a rose and, and it was white and now I want you to th think about the rose as red, and can you do that? Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, well, they all could do that, of course. And I said, well, so now I'm going to say bile canaliculus, and I want you to tell me what comes into your mind. And of course, nothing came into their mind, and I want, at the end of this course, when someone says bile canaliculus, you're going to, and I showed the... Uh, biocanaliculus, this will come into your mind mm -hmm. for every organ when we say, when you read or say someone <coughs> says something that you would immediately have an idea mm -hmm. of how it, how it, what it looks like and how it functions and how structure and function are related to one another. Sure. So that, that, that kind of thing where you, you make goals but you s try to make the goals sort so that the 
student sees the value uh, in, if I want to understand liver, then I better know about biocanaliculus. And, and then downstream, and you, you can start to travel around in the body by thinking of its histology, sure. how you get from here to there, where does the bile go, and how does it get to the intestine, what, so that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like uh, you emphasized a lot of concepts and were more global in your teaching rather than just memorization of lots of details. Yes, I really don't like memorization. The mark of an educated person is knowing where to look it up. Absolutely. <laughs> I can't get you through the Krebs cycle, but if you gave me an hour, I could. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what about graduate training in the lab? Um, I, I always ask students to read a grant that, that was now the, the one that was covering the lab or grant, two, yeah. and uh, recent manuscripts, and to then think about what they would like to do within that context. And the, so it would be limb, but it wasn't always limb. Um, I, people, uh, Paula Mayerson came to me and said that she wanted to be able to dis define all of the feather tracts and when they uh, began to appear in the chick embryo. And we heard a talk today, and that yes. paper was published I don't know, in the 80s sometime. And, and he showed Paula's drawing of this and yes. made, made a point about it, which he wouldn't maybe have made if, yes. if she hadn't done that. So I, I never turned people away, but I turned them off if they weren't making progress. Because and usually the reason for not making progress was that they would come to a lab meeting and start to talk about it and have to redefine the terms for everybody every time it was their turn, mm. and you're you're not part of the lab in a, in a sense, so it had to be integrated into some part of the momentum. So pattern formation, feathers, epithelium with zincomal interaction with feathers, that all goes together. Sure. So that was, very, by our standards now, very descriptive. Um, but it, it fit with limb, because limb and feather have common principles. Yes. So then um, I, I would just let people go, and they had to report on what they were doing at every lab meeting, just a quick, and somebody would do a major presentation. So you just work your way through the lab, but everybody knew what everybody else, else was doing. The other thing was that anybody in the lab could, on listening to another lab member, could say, I think that this would really help out. And so then I had already defined who was lead on the project. Right. So. Uh, if somebody's the lead on the project, Matt Harris, and Sean Hasso says, hey, how about this? Couldn't we do this? Then uh, it would end up that Hasso would be on the paper. Sure. Um, that way people were able to get on papers, and as long as it's uh, Schoenwolf et al., it doesn't matter how many people are trailing after it, and the lead person would be the lead author. Sure. Um, so I wish I had the opportunity to work in your lab <laughs> <laughs> and publish that Sean Wolf at Allen and yeah. Ian Fallon. <laughs> would have been great. too. would have been fun. It would have been fun. Yeah. Anyway, so people were always thinking about how they could contribute. Mm -hmm. And uh, because they know that if, if it came to fruition, uh, they would be part of the writing and, and so forth, and their name would go on the paper. So everybody earned being on a paper. Earned authorship, yeah. yeah. How did you deal with writing with your graduates, well, first, especially non-native English speaking? Right. Well, um, one of the things that we did uh, was to have the, per the person who was lead always wrote the first manuscript. First draft. Yeah, it, 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 yeah first draft. If, if I had to write it, then I would be the first author. So uh, the p people would write uh, the manuscript, and especially with non-English speakers, uh, 
and especially since we you were able to project text, we would go into the uh, our seminar room and put the text up on the screen, mm -hmm. and then I would read it. Taka remembers this. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I would read it, and Sean was on that uh, paper because he had contributed a significant figure to the paper, and so he was at the keyboard and I was reading and Taka was commenting and then we would get stuck at a place and we would be talking about how to proceed here, what, what can we do? And all of a sudden the Sean would be typing and it would change. And uh, or uh, I would get up to the blackboard and I would say, see this line here? I think it goes down here and cut and paste, bang, it's in there. And so you work an hour, and you've made huge progress. Yes. Rather than my annotating it, and and then the the student or postdoc wondering, oh, what he means here. <laughs> well, I'm standing up there saying what I mean, mm -hmm. and if we ran into trouble, what about uh, doc, <coughs> Dr. Smith's thing? Uh, uh, data here. Well, we just go right in, bang, the data are right up in front of us, and then we talk about it, how does it relate to our work, and uh, we make a change or whatever. So extremely dynamic, and it grew out of, that grew out of an earlier mode uh, where we would read manuscripts to each other and try to make changes that way. That slipped away, but then when this ability to be able to project mm -hmm. onto the screen um, came up, uh, then I think that that, that was uh, a, a major breakthrough. And I've told other people about it and they say it, and they have said it worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite unique. I like it a lot. Thank it's a nice you. way to do it. Yeah. Very good. Um, so we were joking about who is your favorite student, and right. I won't, won't ask you that question. Okay. But I would like to know a little bit about some of your students and what they're currently doing. I know many have faculty positions, many have faculty including, including Taka, who's here today. Yes. Uh, two are at the NIH uh, doing um, uh, major leadership roles at the NIH. Mm -hmm. uh, Jill Carrington is one of those. Pet, uh, Rebecca Fulner is another. Um, I have people teaching in small colleges. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Todd is teaching in a small college. Um, uh, Deneen uh, Rowe went on for and got an MD degree and she's a practicing physician. Mm -hmm. But I think that she's a better one because she is uh, trained scientifically. Mark Lunzer is an MD, PhD and is mainly practicing. So there, and uh, my first students. Uh, is he the one that you had the medical issue with when you, when he was doing yes. his dissertation? Did right. You, you want to share that story? Sure. I think that's an interesting uh, uh, one. We, we were in that <coughs> we were in that seminar room, and he was uh, giving his talks, and and that's how we developed talks. People would give the talk in front of the whole lab, and then. Uh, make make changes, and usually went two three times, uh, where the person would give the talk. In in this case, it, it was uh, around the holidays, I think, and Mark and I were in the room, and I was very busy uh, with committee assignments and trying to get a grant in and get Mark finished because he had to go back to the MD part of his training. Yes. And uh, suddenly I lost consciousness and was on the floor and uh, had a syncope, a vasovagal event, and uh, they took me to the hospital, um, lights and sirens, and what, what uh, uh, Mark Lunzer did was to uh, clear my airway, do that whole thing. <laughs> Um, and, and I really was unconscious. I right. Just, um, it was very interesting. So it was my. But you had no hesitation signing off on his dissertation no, after that. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. 
Uh, did you finish on your students who are there? I know you have students throughout the world. Yes. Uh, well, Taka is here in Japan. And in, in talking about the major science that we uh, published and are still doing, I, I, did, I failed to mention that uh, the role of the interdigit and digit identity probably is yeah. uh, the, the top of the list. And uh, Randy Don did that work, and, uh, and Taka Suzuki followed up with that work. And, and it has been a, a, a game changer in that people are now focused on doing work on the autopod rather than doing work on the limb button and then saying what they think it means for the autopod. Yes. And I and I didn't mention that with, uh, when you were, when you were talk we were right. talking about the research, but it it's the last thing and and I think it's the best thing with regard to impact uh, understanding what's going on in the limb that the last thing to arise evolutionarily may not follow the same rules as the things that were in um, fishes essentially um, so. Uh, where everybody is. Uh, let's see, Joanne Cameron is my very first student and a very a very special person to me. Your first student is sure. very special yep. and, and she's retired. <laughs> uh, but she's doing uh, regenerative biology uh, post-retirement at the University of Illinois where she uh, was for her whole career. Mm -hmm. And Rich Pollack teaches in the junior college biology and he uh, is my second student, although recently he thought, he said he, I, he was my first student. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he teaches in a small college and, and I imagine that he, there, it's wonderful for the students mm -hmm. because of uh, his past training and his love of science. So, um, let me see, I miss Paula Meyerson is, is out in, Los Angeles, and she teaches at various places around the area. There are many colleges, and she teaches there. Uh, Do you know offhand how many PhD students you've trained? I, I think it's 20. 20. Yeah. And, and lots maybe, more postdocs, yeah, probably. Yeah, about six postdocs. Six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there were master's degree students. Oh, yes. Paula, for example, was a master's degree. Mm -hmm. that the, what she produced was a, probably a PhD thesis, but she went off and did a PhD elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very productive in your training. Uh, so we've been talking about your role at Madison as a researcher and as a teacher, yes. but you've also been an administrator. Yes. Would you like to talk about that experience, sure. what you liked about it, what your goals were, sure. what you I, didn't like about it? I was appointed, I applied for and I was appointed the assistant dean for graduate studies in the medical school. Mm -hmm. And that meant that in the first place I was ombudsman for all graduate students in the medical school. So if a student was having trouble with their professor or with their chair or whatever it was, they could come to me and I would uh, try to make a plan for them. Uh, if they uh, really desperately wanted to leave, then I would advise them on how to do that with grace. And um, so I enjoyed that very much, even though there, there were lawsuits <laughs> and, and things that it, where I was called to testify, but that, that, that was part of the job. The second part of my job was the MD-PhD program had foundered. Uh, and really, uh, when Mark Lenzer came into my laboratory, uh, he had to pay for uh, essentially the, the MD and the PhD part. He was on my grant. I paid for that, but uh, he, he had a large debt when he left. Um, and I thought that that was a, a crime because he ended up going into practice, good for his patients, um, but not good for science. Um, so what I did was to uh, set about reinstituting the program from the people I 
ask everyone on campus who is doing an MD, PhD uh, on their own to join this new program. So that was the nucleus. Some of those people would not have fared well in ad admission to an, an established MD, PhD mm -hmm. program. But, the, uh, but that didn't matter to me. What mattered to me is that they had, uh, were doing graduate work and also were in, uh, in the MD program. So we instituted a program where the students would earn a, a PhD just like everybody else. So it might take five years or six right. years, and then we would try to make economies when they came back. So they would take uh, the first two years of medicine gross anatomy in the summer, that freed up time in the fall, and yeah. they would be able to uh, rotate in labs. They could then join a lab and go to lab meetings as they could. And then uh, after the second year, after passing the boards, they would move into a lab, do the lab work, and then and at the same time associate themselves with a physician who uh, they had to see at least once a week and go around with. So the, the, and, and it worked. Mm -hmm. We, we sure. had a spectacular class of, uh, of students come in the first time we advertised. And the, the school footed the bill for four. And uh, the students would take hold of the recruitment and they would take them around and they would talk to them about uh, what it was like to be in this program and that we met every Tuesday night and somebody was there to talk and everybody came. Uh, and there was a feeling of real camaraderie. Wonderful. And so it, it eventually it, it came time to write an MSTP uh, proposal and I think that the administration saw that that I had, uh, I had put a lot into getting us to the point where one could go in. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I stepped down and stepped away from the program. And, and after the usual run, trial runs, uh, the MST uh, program has been funded for at least 15 years, I oh, think. Fantastic. Uh, and so that's, that's a, a major accomplishment, and I feel good about it, mm -hmm. because it, it was from nothing, it, in, it was inclusive in the people who were there, and uh, nearly all of those people graduated with an MD, PhD. They helped to form the, the thing, uh, because we have these sessions about what's good, what's bad, what. How, how are we going to do so these things? So they created the program. Yeah. Right. They did. Yeah. They did. Fantastic. And I was then able to attract very good faculty members. Howard Timman, for example, was uh, a trainer before he died. Mm -hmm. And so people joined in. They thought it was a great idea. And so I, I, it was fun for me uh, and, and very challenging. I learned uh, how to lead people, how to run me meetings efficiently, and uh, to just get things done in a transparent way. You are indeed very good at that, having been on committees with you. Did you take some business classes? I or? did. The first thing I did when I came to Wisconsin was take the Evelyn Wood speed reading oh. class uh, during the summer. And uh, it, it, it changed my life because I can read 1,500 words a minute and have 95% comprehension. Mm -hmm. I should say that high school students who were in the class could read 10,000 words a minute with 90% comprehension, which was just totally beyond my uh, capabilities to understand. And uh, then I took a, a male uh, education course on uh, business, uh, leadership and uh, organization. 
And so they would send you uh, things to read and then a, a test and an essay to write and then you mailed it back to them and then they sent it back to you. Of course, It was mail, not Pony Express. Right? It wasn't Pony Express. <laughs> but but it, it had a major effect on my life. I said that because of course you would never do it in the mail. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays. <laughs> Nowadays, it would be much easier. Yeah. You just go online and sure. <laughs> do it. But but that that helped me a lot. Um, and, and with lab meetings, it's the same. We would we would meet for an hour and then we were done. Mm -hmm. Although I have to say one thing: uh, when Randy Don presented his first uh, full lab meeting about the interdigit as a signaling center that causes, that is necessary for the identity of a digit. It was a beautiful May day, I remember. The sun was coming into the seminar room and we were talking about his work and it lasted for four hours. Wow. And we designed every experiment practically that went into the science paper mm -hmm. that came from it. It was so exciting. And he was challenged going pillar to post as to, well, is that the digit three? How, <laughs> you know, how are you making that conclusion? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it, it was, it was, I hadn't expected it. Mm -hmm. Sure. That, but it's just, and I couldn't stop it. Well, I was doing it myself. So sure. I yeah, didn't yeah. want to stop. away with the enthusiasm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, meetings can be productive and can be long, and that's good. Right. Uh, but long meetings that are not productive. <laughs> waste of time. <laughs> just waste everybody time. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, one of the th things we just talked about is your leadership abilities, and <clears throat> you've not only been a leader at Wisconsin and in your field. You've been a leader of AAA. Yes. Would you like to talk about uh, your involvement with AAA sure. and, and uh, how that's affected you over the years? Sure. Uh, AAA was a was an opportunity to merge my uh, teaching life with my research life because the AAA has always been strong in embryology and developmental biology. So I, I used that as a way to get help with teaching mm -hmm. and uh, meet and talk to and uh, schmooze with colleagues. And there was a morphogenesis club, which I was the president of uh, one year, it's a one year term. And uh, we had a symposium that we got people in, but we, uh, and bet people like Betty Hay and yeah. were were there and uh, to to pass on wisdom and on how to get around problems and things like that and mm -hmm. so it, it it was a uh, an extraordinary group of people to join so I I decided to uh, look into the leadership and I was on uh, what's now called called the board of directors for. A term, and and it the, the leadership was uh, for my taste somewhat helter skelter, and the same problems kept coming up over and over again, and and then I I, I dropped away for a year uh, from the AAA. I always went to SDB during those years, and so I I just dropped away, and um, the. Uh, someone called me and asked me to rejoin. And uh, one of the people that talked to me was Bob Yates. And he said that he wanted, he thought I would be good for the AAA and he wanted me to stay with it and, and, and work uh, to make it better. So I, I did that. I was on committees and uh, when the journals uh, came up, it was, it was pretty clear to me and several people that having two straight out, flat out anatomy journals wasn't necessary anymore. And so I took a leading role in um, recasting the American Journal of Anatomy as developmental dynamics. And I took an active role in the uh, finding the first editor and than being on the board, mm -hmm. uh, which was an uphill uh, kind of crazy 
battle to break into the publishing of, of a new journal like that. And, and so, guess what? All of us were on the, on the phone soliciting yes. papers. Please send us your Please send paper. us your papers. And I was very good at that because yeah. I knew how to introduce the topic to make the person ask questions and then do a close. Send us a manuscript that's so right. So, so then uh, Dave Stokem called me and said that um, my name had come up to be the run for president. And would I do that? And it was a six year term and two years pre, uh, two years president, two years past president. And I said, I would do it, but I had, he had to guarantee me I wouldn't be embalmed for any of that time. <laughs> anyway, so that, so that I was elected, and I became the uh, president-elect, and I went to the meeting, and I said to them, the assembled group, it's like I never left. You guys are talking about same stuff. all the same stuff. <laughs> and I guarantee you that when I'm done, all that stuff is going to be done. Yeah. And pretty much it did get to stay. Some of the things arose briefly uh, after I left. But the other some thing... Some of those issues were like zombies. They were. coming back. They, they were. But, but we finished them. And the other thing I said my goal is to <coughs> lower the age of this body, the board of directors, so that young people are here, so that we can see our future. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did that too. And Bob McCuskey followed me, and he, while I was president... Did the postdoc uh, representative come on under your term? Oh, gee. It probably was about so. that. It would be yeah. very close. Yeah. Bob McCuskey sat with uh, at board meetings on my left side and, and Andrea on my right side. And Bob w was just a huge help. Mm -hmm. And he had uh, the perspective of the association for many more years than I had. And uh, so he, he helped me. He was really... Um, and an aid so that we would talk about things and get on the same page. And then my style is to open discussions and to let people uh, talk. And if someone isn't talking, I say, you know, you're not sitting here yeah. and you're going to vote and I need to know why, yeah. what it is. And so people did that. and. Um, I, I looked forward to, to going to the board meetings. One of the board meetings was right after 9-11. It was by telephone. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a great idea, but no one else did. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mind it because I had them sitting uh, at my desk. Uh, I knew the, the order, and I just visualized the order. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't hear from anybody, I'd put a check, and then I would say to the person, you haven't said anything. Same as if they were there. Sure. And missing was body language, yes. nuance, somebody getting up, whatever. Um, and, and so we did it once, but it was fun. Yeah. Certainly and, a lot less expensive. To yes, do that, that, that was, yeah. To that's have true. everyone travel. Yeah. But yeah. it's hard to do that. You know, you've done study sections over the phone. Yes, it is and, hard. Or, or a special study section right. where you need to draw the people out if you're the chair, mm -hmm. uh, and speak up if you're not. So, and if you're not, and somebody's not speaking up, if I'm not the chair, somebody's not speaking up, I ask them to tell me what they're thinking about. Sure. So, um, I, I enjoyed my time in the leadership, uh, and, and I enjoy mentoring uh, at all levels, so, and I still do that. Mm -hmm. And you're still actively involved. You're on the research, what is it called? I don't remember, strategic thinking or planning committee. Right, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And I should also mention that you're the past awardee of Henry Gray. Yes, I research. am, and I'm proud of that. 
and the uh, Distinguished Service Award. I, I am. And, the Aaron J. Ladman Award. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and that to me is, is uh, amazing because Ladman invited me to be on the editorial board. He sent me manuscripts to review and he would uh, tell me uh, whether this was harsh or, you know, we could do this better. And th then I was on the board and just working with Ladman and learning how to be an editor mm -hmm. uh, was uh, invaluable. Yes. So the people associated with anatomy and developmental biology have, have just been wonderful and I, I couldn't possibly be where I am. When you consider I've been doing this for 47 years and when I came in we were uh, doing experiments that were cut and paste, that's all they were. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were very provocative and so you get the data and then you could say anything you wanted to and it made sense, you know, <laughs> somebody else might have raised the issue or something. But now, of course, you have genes and, and you have signaling pathways and you, it's harder to just make something up out of whole cloth. But the, the secret for me and the joy is that the, the, the molecular and genetic people doing developmental biology would always help me across uh, all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and the anatomy department at Wisconsin would give me six months off to just retool. And so I, I remade myself several times mm -hmm. with that. And I couldn't have done it because I couldn't leave Madison. I didn't feel like I could leave Madison. and. Um, I, it, it ended up that it, uh, it was at least as good mm -hmm. because sure. I was uh, I could I would, could get people to visit, come and give a seminar, talk to me, and then personal relationship. And these are twenty years younger or more <laughs> sometimes. Uh, but but um, and then uh, I, I despaired of ever getting an in situ hybridization to work in my lab. And, <laughs> John Lau went to Germany and learned how to do it. He was at the medical college, and he was on sabbatical, and I asked him to come to my lab for a summer right after, adjoining his sabbatical, and tell us about FGFs, and tell us about how to do in c 2s mm -hmm. And of course, the, that was right at the beginning of my attempt to really, really change. And those FGF papers are highly cited and, yes. and influential and published in Developmental Dynamics. Yes. Um, so Just barely, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was a tough sell. <laughs> yeah. So, well, you never know. Um, so the, 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 I, I, the AAA and the Developmental Biologists, the Society for Developmental Biology has been extremely important in my career. Mm -hmm. The two of them together made for terrific uh, options, meeting people, but I could never have done it without uh, how generous people are with their time. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, so we've been talking really about your professional life mostly, yeah. and I know, uh, having traveled with you quite a bit, yeah. I know you like tea. Yes. I know you like scotch. Right. Would you talk a little bit about how you got interested sure. in tea and scotch? I got interested in tea because I can't drink coffee. And uh, it makes me, I have a food sensitivity to it, it cramps my stomach. Uh, and so Saunders drank, drank tea, Lipton tea. And he, when he would come into class, he would be making tea. And I thought, oh, that's, not, that's pretty interesting. So I asked him about it. Uh, what is this? And because I had never. I didn't know anything about it. He said, well, it's just tea, and I, I, I enjoy it, and I don't drink coffee. So I, I thought, well, I'll try it, and I did. And uh, so for years, I drank Lipton tea um, and, and enjoyed it. I thought it was just wonderful. Um, um, and then one day, while, when I was in Madison, when I first arrived, I went to a tea shop, and the owner was Reed Dufresne, who called himself the tea man. And uh, 
I, I went and, and I looked at the prices of these things, and I bought an, an ounce, and it was fifty dollars or something. I thought, wow, this is okay, an ounce. But I, I took it and, and I made some tea, and it was wonderful. I mean, this is what really was supposed to be. So Reed Dufresne and I became friends, and. Um, he had a little group that he called his board of directors, and he would uh, take about five, six people, and it would have, rotating maybe two, three years, and he would uh, teach us about tea, and he would ask us what he thought of his, this new marketing thing that he was going to do, and he would give us teas. So um, Darjeeling, very high-end teas. And um, so I, I, he, he just taught me about teas mm -hmm. and what's in a bag. And, and that it's, what's in a bag generally is called sweepings because it's what's left over. And he was a broker and during the time when the teas were being sold, he would buy, buy tea for, I don't know who, Tet Tetley, let's say. And he would buy a year's supply of Tetley and they would make it into, into their tea put it in bags and they put it out on, on the shelf and you'd come in and buy the Tetley and you would say, oh geez, it's a little off. And then, and then you would get used to it and then the next year you would say, oh geez, it's a little off. And because it was not the same, right? It yeah, was just a right. little different, but that's what he did. Yeah. He was a broker. Mm. And so he, he introduced me to tea and, uh, and I, I thoroughly enjoy it and I in introduce everybody I can't tea, and you certainly have introduced me and right. trained me and mentored me through that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and then Reed died, and I'll I was call gonna... you the tea man. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> everything I know about tea, I owe to you. Well, uh, the thank you. <laughs> the the um, Reed Dufresne died, and then of, I was cut loose. I said, "What was I going to do?" So I went on the internet. By that time. And I was going to go to San Francisco. The students had invited a group of people to go out and give seminars, uh, Gail Martin's people. And I met Shink's son at that time. Oh, yes. Uh, and um, so I looked, and there was this imperial tea a court, and um, it, it looked good. So I went out a day early. You don't receive royalties from the imperial tea no, court, right? No. No disclaimers here? No. no. But I, but I know the, the owners now, and um, uh, I went there, and I went to their place in Chinatown, which was this beautiful wood-lined place, with, and, and I sat there and I drank teas for three hours. Mm. And so at the end of that, I, I said I would buy some teas, and, and they said to me, well, from the teas, that you've been tasting, that you like, and you're going to buy. We have this new tea, and, and, and here, smell this tea. And I said, oh, it's, it smells like Key Moon. And they, and they said, yes, <laughs> and we just got it in. And I said, oh, I'll buy it. And so I bought my tea from them. Um, for, uh, all my tea I buy from them, from except them. when I'm in Japan, when Taka, is my tea man, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, really uh, helps me out with Japanese tea, which not are not sold all over the world. Cool. And as far as Scotch whiskeys go, uh, I always like Scotch whis whiskeys, but uh, I went with Gary Schoenwolf <laughs> to Scotland, where we went. We co-mentored on that. Yes, trip. we went. <laughs> we needed help, and and it was it was absolutely. Uh, we went to Speyside one time and to Isla, I guess. Uh, Isla. Isla. Uh, the other time and, and just and tasted. And uh, it was just a, an amazing event. And what was it, two days ago? We two tasted days ago, Japanese whiskey. We tasted Japanese whiskey and walking into the uh, cask storage room with that wonderful fragrance. <laughs> you could just stay there for a while. We could. <laughs> we did. Yes. <laughs> that. Yes. Wonderful, John. It's really been great talking to you today. Thank you. Uh, do you have anything you want to say in closing, or? Well, we? uh, I want. I want to say that uh, my career has been amazing. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. That's it. I would second that. That's been amazing. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Taka. Thank you.